Hey guys, it's Candace and Kayla, and we are directionally challenged. Oh yeah, we thought we'd just have it all figured out by the time we were in our thirties. But surprise, we don't. We no, definitely don't. <laughs> we don't. But that's okay. You know, we are figuring it all out, and we have a wonderful guest today who is going to guide us through um, a very exciting conversation that uh, I've been really excited to have. Uh, Something I have not shared yet on this podcast is that I'm actually pregnant. I've got a bun in the oven. (laughs) Yep. Um, This has been, uh, I'm a little over five months. So it's been the entirety of um, the whole quarantine experience and everything that 2020 has uh, brought us this year. And, and it's been a journey to say the least. And so I feel comfortable and confident enough to discuss it now. I am someone who likes to, um, who likes to keep pregnancy and to myself and obviously with my partner, my husband and our immediately friend, immediate friends and family until I feel comfortable and confident that I'm in a good place in my pregnancy and that, you know, my baby's okay and I'm okay as best as we can be. And so, um, but I'm finally at that place right now, which feels really good. So today we're talking about pregnancy. (laughs) It's so exciting. It's so exciting. And, you know, it's one of those things where, um, it's been hard to keep secret because it's just such a wonderful, lovely, optimistic, part of life in a time that there's optimism can be hard to find right now. And I know that this has been quite a journey having to, you know, navigate this news and your body during a, an experience that is not easy in our world right now, but you have done such a good job doing it. And I am so proud to be alongside you during this. And how are you feeling right now, Candace? I know everyone listening is just jumping up and down, hopefully not if they're driving, but just so excited for you. So tell us how you're feeling um, physically, emotionally, mentally, and how's baby doing? Physically, I feel great. I was really lucky to have a smooth transition into a uh, more energetic second trimester. Um, I'm moving around so much less this pregnancy than I did my first pregnancy. I realize like how stagnant I am because I don't really go anywhere. Um, it takes a lot more effort to convince myself to go on a walk, um, which really ties into a lot of the emotional weight that I've been carrying around. Um, you know, quite honestly, it's actually been easier for me to not talk about pregnancy this Mm. time around. It's been kind of odd to share the experience in discussing it with friends and family because I can't really physically share the experience of hugging friends right now comfortably or, you know, knowing when I'm going to see my family next. And I haven't seen them this entire pregnancy so far. Um, And so it's all weighed on me emotionally, even navigating it with, you know, my, uh, my family here in my home, um, because it's just been such an emotional experience, uh, for everybody, you know, navigating the basically, yeah, having to quarantine and keep ourselves safe and healthy. And so, that's um, a lot of what inspired wanting to have this episode today to talk about it is I usually I'm, you know, so excited and I'm so thrilled and it's and I have other we both, you know, Kayla and myself have other friends who are pregnant and I have all of the excitement for them. And it's been really hard for me to kind of find that um, feeling comfortable in my joy this time mm-hmm. around because quite honestly, I'm just scared. I'm really scared. And it's been a fear-based pregnancy so far. Um, yeah, I, I can understand that feeling. I know I felt scared going through the process and the world was 
quote unquote normal at that time. And so I can't imagine adding everything that's going on on top of all the hormones and emotions and everything that comes along with being pregnant. I do have to say I have seen you in person from a distance with masks on and you are adorably cute and so <laughs> pregnant. <laughs> when it, it had been a while since I had seen Candace. They went away on their family trip and um, we reconnected. We were starting the podcast up again and she came back and she ha had popped and it's the cutest little belly. <laughs> and um, there's no denying that you're pregnant. I feel like you're at the point now where if you do make it to the grocery store with your mask, that people will lift anything and everything for you because you are just so obviously adorably pregnant. And um, I'm so excited for you and so happy for you. You were there with me through my whole journey and I'm just excited to be right here with you. And we also have an amazing guest on today who, I mean, you, Candice, found her on, I believe, social media, correct? Yeah, I found her on social media. Today, we're talking with Hayes Hawk. She's a certified doula, a midwife, life coach, mentor, community leader. She's also a mother. Uh, I just became so inspired by her social media posts, her on her Instagram, just she's just so positive. She, the way that she talks about beyond just being a doula and, and being a mother or, or bringing a child into this world, just what it means to be human right now. And not only connect with yourself, but to connect with nature. And it was so many things I'd been pushing away. I really, it was important to me to have a doula in my first birth, uh, for my first pregnancy. But it's interesting looking back because I didn't even really spend that much time with her. You know, I was living in Atlanta. I gave birth in Denver, Colorado. And so I kind of just treated it as something that you check off of a list. So even though a doula is meant to be a more intimate experience and, and they're there to really, um, you know, you want to connect with this person and they're there to, you know, guide you through labor and, and even before labor and, you know, postpartum as well, um, which for our listeners, you will also hear Hayes kind of discuss, uh, what a doula is if you are unfamiliar with the term. Um, but I really didn't get to know her very well. It was all from a distance. And so I think a lot of things are coming back up again, where I was so excited to have a birth and a pregnancy where I actually got to live with my husband because that didn't happen the first time around. Oh, where right. I got he to, was in Denver. You were in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. I got to know my doctor um, on a better level. And that's, I don't even know what my doctor's full face looks like. I only know what her eyes look like because we're all masked up every time. Wow. Um, you know, Joe is unable to come to any of the appointments and which is, you know, unfortunately what we experienced for a majority of our pregnancy last time as well. Um, you know, I don't think I'm going to be able to have like our kids or my mom there in the room. Um, and I was so excited to have this experience with like getting to know a doula and she was going to be there. And, and now that might not even be able to happen. So it, it's, I've, been, you know, quite frankly, in a very um, unsettled place emotionally and trying to do as much work with on myself as I can. Um, but I'm so excited that you know, Hayes Hawk has, you know, been able to make time to be with us today. And so that we're able to just have this really vulnerable conversations. And, and we actually, between Kayla and I, um, you know, I have three other friends who are pregnant and we're all within a few months of each other. And it seems that there are a lot of women who find themselves pregnant right now, or maybe because I'm pregnant, I just notice it more when I like look in social media or when I go to the store, I can like see, I'm like drawn to other women who are also pregnant right now. But we wanted to have this space. So, um, cause I've felt a lot of experiences of feeling isolated and alone. I think we all have, but to add pregnancy on top of that, just so that you know, as our listener, if you are pregnant during this time on top of feeling isolated due to COVID that, you know, you are not alone and that there, there are, um, there are coping mechanisms. There are things that we can do to connect ourselves to our, our pregnancies. And, and I'm so just thrilled that Hayes is joining us today. I really want to dive right in 
to the to a word and a mantra that I really tried to hold on to in my first pregnancy and my first delivery, which um, was really hard for me to keep. And um, I, I feel it coming back into this pregnancy. And I'm really struggling given the current um, climate of the world with COVID-19. But the word is surrender. Mm. And I feel like it's such an important part of um, not only the pregnancy element of you know, bringing a new life into this world, but specifically birth and delivery. Um, but just as a human right now, <laughs> existing in this world, um, I feel like I have yet to surrender to 2020 and every in the emotional roller coaster that it's been. Um, how have you been doing um, in 2020? You know, what does that word mean to you just beyond pregnancy and birth, but just as a human right now existing? Yeah, oh, that's a very, very good. First of all, it's a powerful word to use mm-hmm. in birth, right? But in life, I think what I have been doing is surrendering, not in a resignation, not surrendering, like I give up, not surrendering, like, oh, well, I tried and you know, I just can't anymore. Not, it doesn't have that energy for me, but it is a surrendering up to that divine, that infinite wisdom, surrendering up to my higher self, surrendering up to something bigger than the small self, you know? Um, so that's really kind of where I've been living and how I've been kind of maneuvering, but also being really kind to myself and really conscious about where my energy is and what I'm doing and how I'm taking care of myself. You know, you hear these stories about everybody, um, you know, like they're drinking a lot or they're eating all the comfort food and baking all the bread, right? <laughs> right now. Mm-hmm. And yep. <laughs> really in this time, because it is such a heightened time, because it is such a time where we are really impacted by our environment and society and the things that are going on in the world, it's actually the time to really hone in and eat pristinely because you're, you're feeding your soul, your body, your mind. You know, it's not just for your for the taste buds. You know, I, I think that a lot of people are diving into that hedonistic world, but really right now, we got to be on point. We've got to drop into that um, higher energetic field. So eating well, drinking lots of water, processing our emotions, um, really uh, looking at the way that we are speaking into this 2020. You know, so I'm very mindful about what I call out into 2020 because 2020 is an entity that has a life of its own. And what I'm really trying to do is still be able to control how I show up and what and who I'm going to be after 2020. So I'm focusing on, you know, creating, you know, who am I going to be as a person? What is my mind? Where's my mindset going to be? Um, What are my goals for 2022? Like I'm already there. I'm very much present yeah. here, but I'm looking to see who I'm going to be and how I'm going to be on the other side of COVID and how that's going to affect my, the, you know, my world around me and then my relationship with my clients. In the idea of turning inward and looking inward, um, some can find that to be a scary place because mm-hmm. it might be new territory for them mm-hmm. or decide that it's really isolating um, as opposed to um, powerful and comforting and actually strength building and, and soul connecting it, that, you know, for those who struggle with maybe feeling that they're, that they need other people to build them up or they need other people around them to comfort them. Um, and beyond just like, of course, as humans, like we want comfort and we want, we're social creatures and we need people. Um, but what are some of the, uh, tools or advice that you have for anyone that does struggle with taking that time to turn inward? Well, you know, I think it's all about perspective. So for some people, yes, this time is very frightening. They, they probably are meeting themselves for the first time mm. because they've been running around and doing the things and having the life and, you know, all that avoidance. And now there's nowhere to run. You just have to either deal or you're going to check out, right? And I invite, like the people who come to me for coaching, um, I invite them to 
take a childlike curiosity into the exploration of themselves. Like, you know, look at it like, oh, this is an opportunity. I, I didn't know that I really needed people. I didn't know how tactile I was. I didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't know. And look at all of that as a journey of discovery into themselves. Um, that's where I start when I'm having conversations with my clients. And then if they um, express, you know, anxiety or concern about that journey, um, my conversation usually begins with, usually begins with, why are you afraid to meet yourself? What have you heard? Where does that fear come from? And we track it back. You know, it's not starting right then. It has a storyline. It has a place where somebody made a choice that that means something. And so I want to take it back to that place and find out what where the fear is of self-recognition, why there's fear of understanding themselves, exploring who they are, what they think. Usually it's about the the idea that if they tell the truth about who they are, they won't be loved or accepted. Or if they, uh, if they choose differently from their tribe, which is something that we all have to do when we're growing up. We look at what the tribe believes, what our family, our foundation, the, the pastor, the, the Rebbe, whoever, um, what they believe and look at what we believe, what we want to do. It's the same thing. I, I kind of do this when I'm talking to my birthing clients. Because, you know, I always say to them, I, I really encourage you to think about and discuss who you're going to be as parents, not who your parents were and what they want you to do, not who your friends are and what they want you to do, and not society, because everybody else will be raising your child except for you. You two have to decide who you are as parents, who you are as partners, and what that's going to look like. It's the same kind of thing. Stepping into a place of absolute knowing and owning of your choices there's a lot of accountability and responsibility and that's scary for some people but when you take it on and you look at it as an adventure as a journey of self as of as a discovering and an unfolding then it becomes exciting and fun and there you know my clients usually get into it so that's that's what i'm doing <laughs> over here with my people <laughs> I love that. I mean, just even hearing you discuss all this, there is such a sense of serenity and calmness that comes over my body. There is something magic about you. I love it so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> So these are really difficult times for people in general. And you're mm -hmm. right. We are all learning about ourselves. And, um, you know, you throw Candace's situation in the mix as well and other people who are going through this um my sister delivered a few months ago in the hospital wasn't sure if her partner was able to come in there's just so much unknown um yeah. what is there a mantra like candace's mantra such as surrender or something that we can continually do i don't want to say something quick but something that is easily that we can touch into easily that can continually keep us centered within ourselves the breath the breath the breath immediately every day it's an essential right but really being mindful about your breathing like even if you take five minutes to do a few deep breaths to really take it into your body because most of us are shallow breathing we're breathing right up here in the chest and that's not doing anything to bring us back to homeostasis. It's not connecting with the vagus nerve. It's not doing any of that. So when we can take that time, even if it's five minutes, to just take that deep breath in through the nose, to hold it at the top, to exhale slowly, and then to like do a few cycles of that, that will automatically bring your body back to homeostasis and bring you back to the present. Because when we're in fight or flight, that, that, you know, we're just like this, right? Anxious, fearful, scared about. And, you know, there's lots to be afraid about. But in this moment, like right here, right now, everything is good. Mm. We're okay. And for my clients who have anxiety issues and anxiety attacks, when I'm talking them down, I'm like, okay, let's, let's just check in and tell the truth about this. Five minutes ago, before this happened, were you fine? Five minutes ago, were you able to breathe? Five minutes ago, were you feeling? And usually they can say, oh, I was just fine. And I said, right, so this is a reaction to you future tripping. You lost mm -hmm. the present and you went to the future. So really connecting with the breath 
and then being mindful about where you are and the truth of what's happening. You know, because if you were okay five minutes ago breathing, then you can still breathe at five minutes later. You know, it's just kind of really simple things. It doesn't take a lot. And I'm really trying to keep people out of their minds, mm-hmm. out of their heads. Mm-hmm. I want them to drop into their bodies and drop into their hearts. Um, that if you can drop into the breath, then you can remember the truth of who you are. And the truth of who we all are is love because that's how we are here. You know, the whole journey to be alive is through the love of life and love of self. And I just want to remind everybody, you know, connect with your breath. It'll drop you into your heart and everything will be okay. You know, and, and each moment, everything will be okay. And that does not mean that we're ignoring the craziness that's outside of our doors but it means that you're taking the opportunity to make a choice to be joyful to be connected to be in the present which then it sets you up to be able to handle everything that's surrounding you we don't connect with our breath and take that opportunity or meditate or do yoga or whatever it is that you do to bring yourself a little bit of solitude and a little bit of solace you know, if we don't do those things, we're putting ourselves in a crisis place. We're putting ourselves in the, um, in the position of creating disease in the body, in the mind, and in our spirits. And right now, we just really have to be, you know, conscious of that. It's, yeah, I, that's been probably the biggest struggle of this pregnancy is feeling that I am in fight or flight mode at all times. You know, it, walking to get something from the store and just looking around and being like, am I putting myself at risk right now? Am I in control of my health and my body for the safety of myself for this baby and the rest of my family? Mm -hmm. And it's just had such a wall up for me against anyone around me. Um, It's, you know, been really difficult navigating, you know, in a home full, we're a house full of five people, Um, and, you know, meeting everyone's needs through their emotional experience during COVID while also fearing for my own as well. And, you know, trying to let go of that fear. Um, before we got on the phone, I, I, I called, I was telling, um, Kayla and Melissa that I called my doctor just in a panic one day, just needing to hear from somebody else what they'd seen and what their experience has been. And, and COVID has been such a real fear for me, but that it traps in your body and it's really hard to physically release that. And especially in the stage of pregnancy, wanting to connect to your pregnancy and drop into your body and, and connect with, you know, your baby. I've found that really difficult this time around. Mm -hmm. Um, in a whole new way. Have you heard this from a lot of the mothers that you've been working with? Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It is, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of stress on the body and around pregnancy anyway, and now it's really heightened. Um, and depending on your belief system, it can span the spectrum. It can be you know, really hypersensitive where you, like I have some clients who have not left the house since March, um, you know, which is deep and intense. Um, and I'm just kind of trying to encourage them to, you know, take a walk. So you don't have to do anything. You can, you can, <laughs> you know, you can um, go around people, but just to go out and take a walk you know, for just a little bit. I think that it's really important right now for my clients to remember that they are, so there's a couple of things. Let me just, let me take it back a little bit. There's a couple of things. One is the idea that we are, just because we walk on two feet, that we're separate from the animal kingdom and we are not, right? That we are very much a part of this system that's here on this planet. Mm -hmm. And when you remember that you're part of the animal kingdom and that that's where we are. And just because we walk on two feet, that doesn't make a difference. We can drop into that animal nature. There is a sense of knowing and understanding the process and trusting the process where the mind doesn't get in the way. And usually that's, you know, those are the things. I mean, sometimes there's issues of anatomy and physiology in, you know, pregnancy and labor, but usually it's the mind that gets in the way. Of, of a you know straightforward, uninventful, uninvasive 
vaginal birth. Um, mm-hmm. And so what I'm constantly doing is reminding my clients, you know, who they are in that sense. So I ask them questions. I ask, um, do you trust the process of pregnancy? And I wait for their answer. I ask them, do you believe in the body's ability to have a baby? And I wait for that answer. So it's kind of going down those routes and getting them back into what they believe is true. Um, Again, out of their heads and into their body. And I encourage them not to get saturated and not to feed their souls with too much negativity and speculism and controversy that if they feel like they need facts to go to one great source, get that fact, shut down the TV, Mm -hmm. shut down the computer, (laughs) shut down, you know, because anything you take in, you're digesting, you know, it's going through your system. And, you know, so if you want a pure source of something, then that's fine. Get that source and then shut it down and then drop into the beauty and the sacredness and the amazingness and the joyful aspect of your pregnancy. You know, let's, let's be, let's be in this world Mm. because this world is what you can control. There's a lot out here that we cannot control, but we can control how we process, how we nurture ourselves, how we feed ourselves, how we take care of ourselves. And we can also control, um, our connection to life, you know, that baby. Mm. It's so funny to hear you say all this because my daughter just turned one. So we've just been through this whole process, which was amazing. And it was our first time doing it. So there were so many times throughout the process that I just kept telling myself, people have been doing this for so many years before there were hospitals and doctors and all of this is such a natural state of being a woman. This is a part of us. And even when there were moments of scary times rushing to the hospital, doing all the other. So there are times when the world feels chaotic and this is pre COVID. This is, I can't even imagine Candace, how you feel and Hayes, how your other clients feel right now, but just tapping into that idea that women have been doing this for so many years. And this is part of who we are, um, kept me grounded. So it's funny, Candace. I don't think I ever thought I had a mantra or anything like that until you just said that surrender was your word. And I'm realizing now that that idea was sort of my quote unquote mantra that kept me grounded and sane through the whole experience. Yeah, absolutely. And I always actually remind mamas that they are not laboring alone, mm-hmm. that there are hundreds of thousands of other women in labor at the same time that they are. And always, always the ancestors are looking down and waiting to see the next line coming through, you know. Um, And it's a little different right now for women of color, Black women especially, who are pregnant right now, and then having to do with this. So it's been, so this, not only am I talking to them about their pregnancy and their vision of their labor and what that postpartum is going to look like and how to really heal and take care of themselves. But I also have to talk a mama down, especially if she's birthing a black son, right? Mm -hmm. That whole thing, like the, the, the fear and the angst and the anxiousness, the worry, all of that. I'm, I'm kind of doing a lot of counseling, not kind of, I am doing a lot of counseling on just that alone and then we get to the pregnancy you know um, it's just, so it's a lot to navigate there's lots to unpack there's um you know and then there's like finding their again their belief system i believe that the babies coming through right now are designed to come through they are ready they are ancient souls that like I, I on my page you'll see there's some pictures of babies who look like they're like i don't know you, you you know they're just born, but they look like they're like about ninety nine. They're like little Yoda. Yeah. And I'm looking at them like, okay, and they have such a presence about them. Their eyes are engaged and locked mm-hmm. on me. They they can like look around like this, like slow. Like I don't even understand. Except I. I get it. They know so much it. more than all of us combined. Yeah. Oh, so much more. They're de- they are designated. They agreed to come through. They have 
a sense of self that is absolutely different. I, I, I don't even know how I can explain mm-hmm. it to you, but they're mm-hmm. the babies from the last two years. I don't even know. Um, I did want to ask you about specifically working with black mothers and the maternal death rate. Um, the fact that it's three times higher specifically for black women and the highest. Um, Mm -hmm. And does that factor into when you work with black mothers as their doula or as their, um, uh, as their uh, mentor coach uh, to prepare them to, you know, I, I can't believe I even have to say it, but like speak up for themselves and, and, and have an extra awareness of their health when they go into a hospital to have a baby. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, this is, uh, I can't even, I I can get out. Um, it is very much a part of my conversations. I actually just had a conversation yesterday with, um, a couple and the first, one of the first things he asked me was, you know, in my mind, I always thought, I could just show up and be there for my 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 wife and to you know see my baby being born and now I feel like I have to be really vigilant and I can't really be present for that I've got to you know make sure I've got to guard her I've got to protect her you know that's what he's feeling and I said babe that's that's one of the reasons why you found me you know, I'm going to take on some of that for you. Mm. I want you to be present for her. I want you just to be focused on the baby. And I'm going to be looking, even though right now in hospital births, I'm going in virtually, right? But in that ability to be virtual, the way we've been doing it, I can see everything and I can hear everything. So a lot of times I'm interjecting or I'm, or I'm reminding them that this mama has an allergy to that and she can't have that. Or um, I'm like, okay, could you reframe the way you're speaking? Because mm-hmm. that's a little bit triggering and they can't even hear what you're saying. I know what you're saying, but I want you to reframe that. Like I'm having to do those types of things because otherwise it comes in. If you realize that they're educated in a very systemic way, a very it's in their books, how they treat black people. And um, I actually posted and shared about it because I couldn't believe it. Um, that And this, the latest edition was 2017. So it's still very much wow. taught in their education system about how it, it, Jewish people, black people, Asian people, and, and you know anybody that is not, um, that is, a, you know, has been racialized as white when they're born that they don't have the same conversation it's the same way when i bring in a couple who is black versus when i bring in a couple who is white the questions and the intake totally different um a um, child protective service person will be sent to a black family before it's sent to a white family and for no reason other than that they're black it's ridiculous and um, within it, I still managed to get them back to a place of hope and get them up to a back to a place of possibility and to know that when they are bringing children in, and this is for everybody, that bringing children into the world means hope and it means a future and it means belief, you know, and, and right now, everyone, whatever belief system you have, whatever faith or if nature is your your thing, dropping into that and really um, connecting with it and, and embracing it is going to be really important. So if you believe in the infinite wisdom and infinite intelligence of all, or if you believe in God or Jesus or whatever, right now is the time to really hone that because we need a faith system um, to do to continue on and to have like um, faith in the future. And I had a I have a client also I saw yesterday. Yesterday was busy. <laughs> um, <laughs> where you know they're like, well, I don't believe in God. And I said, okay, what do you believe in? And they said, I believe in Mother Nature. I believe in nature. I believe in the elements, and sciences. And I said, great. I said, okay, so you're pagan? And she was like, yes. And I said, fantastic, because all of that 
is through an infinite design and it's all beautiful and there's cycles and there's seasons and there's a rootedness. You can absolutely dive into that and that can be your grounding place and your place for springboarding into the future. You know, so it's about just finding every individual person's belief system to anchor themselves in so that they can do the journey beautifully. Anchor is such a powerful Mm -hmm. word because it does feel like um, currently with the state of our world that we are all a little floating up here and trying to figure things out and scrambling and and just that word even anchor making us um, feel centered and safe is so important. How does someone like Candace in her situation continually make herself feel anchored and supported? And how does she ask for support from her friends like me, from her husband, from her family at home, from her support system, especially in those times when she feels, you know, maybe not so anchored? Right, right. I think the first thing that you can do, because usually what happens is that there is just an uh, outburst of emotions and feelings. What doesn't come out is, hold on, I'm feeling so ungrounded. What comes out is, okay, I just need some quiet. You guys are just like, really? Can we just, can you go away for a second? I just... (laughs) You know, that it comes out like that or no, I don't want to, I don't want to go out to tea. I can't right now. I just, you know, I just got things to do. You know, it comes out like that. But really, if you can, again, take the moment to connect with the breath, which will drop you into your body, which will have you take a moment and say, you know what? I feel like I need something. I don't know what it is I need. And then go into your partner and say, I feel like I need something. In all transparency, I have no idea what it is, but I'm feeling not balanced or, you know what, I I don't feel, I don't feel grounded. I don't feel anchored. And then it's just about friends and support listening and waiting for her to say, what do you think? Or do you have any ideas? Because sometimes just the expression will do it. Just to Mm. be able to get it out of their bodies and saying, it's feeling really big right now and a hug will do it or a smile will do it or just somebody that knows them really well saying, girl, I hear you. I love you. You're doing great. You're amazing. Just take it one moment at a time. That's, mm-hmm. a, that's, that's going to just go shoulders drop, tears fall. Smiles up. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Do you want to go for tea now? <laughs> Such a release. <laughs> Such a great release. <laughs> uh, really simple. What's interesting? Yeah. Mm-hmm. What, were you gonna what say? I found that I, what I found that I've kept wanting in that vein is, um, I in those moments is uh, what eventually comes out after a lot of pushing away and trying to retreat or push everyone away from me <laughs> is um, that I want to feel safe. I want to feel protected. And that's kind of become the theme of, I think, my reluctancy to be able to surrender into this pregnancy this time around because it just doesn't feel safe. And, and you know, and there's a lot of emotions running high in our house. You know, we have a four-year-old that's adjusting to, you know, COVID. It, you know, my husband and I are doing everything that we can individually to, you know, work through our own stuff and together. Um, I also have two teenage stepdaughters who have their needs and their emotional, you know, unrest throughout this whole experience um, on top of, you know, just logistical things that are coming up, you know, in I, I know this podcast is coming out a few weeks from now, but the fact that in the news, it's saying schools are going to open and, you know, all these things are going to be progressing and it feels so out of my control. Mm-hmm. And so I just spin out into these moments of saying, I want to feel protected and I want to feel safe. And it feels like something no one can promise me. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I don't, that's what I don't know how to tackle. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah during this time? Well, I will give you what I suggest for my clients because that is a common, you know, very common theme. Um, Because it's also very, it's very challenging to feel protected right now when 
we've got the powers that be that feel like they're not protecting us, right? But we can start to protect ourselves. And what that looks like is that you're eating well. You know, you know, I mean, who doesn't love a cheesy moment? <laughs> we all do. <laughs> we all love a cheesy moment. I love a cheesy moment, you know, just as much as the next chick. But I know that cheese does not do great for me, so I don't eat it. But that idea of comfort food, that's not going to serve you. And you're not protecting yourself if you're eating it, right? Mm -hmm. Now, a bite or two, that's fine. But you want to be protecting your body and your environment and your child by eating well. You want to be protecting, protecting your body and your spirit and your, your emotional place by taking the time to either breathe deeply, meditate, take some um, minutes to read a chapter of a book. You know, it doesn't have to be huge, but that, con that what am I saying? That consistency starts to make you land within yourself and starts to make you feel safer because you know you have your own back. You know you are protecting yourself. You know you are feeding yourself well. You know that you're getting the sleep that you need. You know that you're loving hard, strong, and powerfully. You know, all those things will start to help you create safety within my human suit, which means that you are safe in protecting your baby. And then start to go outward. But we got to start inside first. You know, we can't look outside before we're taking care of ourselves and protecting ourselves and having ourselves feel reassured. Then we can start reaching out to our family and our friends for that feeling of protection. But it starts within ourselves. Hey guys, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back in just a minute. back i'm wondering if there's a and i don't know i'm just being a helpful friend over here um, but <laughs> wondering if there's a mantra or something that you and i'm not saying don't stick with surrender because that word is so wonderful but if there's also a mantra you can add on to this that in times when you aren't feeling safe that you can kind of repeat to yourself or something so that you do feel um just more grounded and, and just better. And you, so you can kind of focus on taking care of yourself in that moment. Mm -hmm. You know, I, it, it really depends. Some of the, the work I do with my clients is finding out what words are. Mm -hmm. People let go is powerful. Just, I'm letting go. I'm letting go. I'm letting go. Or I am safe. I am safe. Mm -hmm. I am safe. Powerful. Full is the good word that people love. Full. There's a lot of mamas right now that they are, when they feel in those moments, very small and, you know, very fragile, that they use the word, I am the goddess. Mm -hmm. I am the god. Mm -hmm. You know, especially when they're just carrying this life and they're feeling yeah. so voluptuous <laughs> and just, you know, oh, um, but, you know, a lot of times if, if they are, if especially because I believe in working with the goddesses in this pregnancy space. Um, so if they are really trying to drop into the feminine and own that, that nurturing, receptive, creative, fertile place, then working with that word, I'm the goddess. And goddesses, you know, that's so ancient, that state, that entity, that archetype is so ancient that the feeling just kind of makes them kind of, you know, rise up. Mm. And and that's that's really lovely. So I hear let it flow, I hear let it go, I hear I am the goddess, I am strong, I am powerful, I am safe, I have all that I need. You know, that's a really powerful one. I have all that I need. I am all that I need. Yeah. And that we're yeah. going over and over and over again. That's the one my clients pick the most. But we've got <laughs> there are all those different choices. I love that. When did you, uh, were you a mother before or after you became a doula? At what point did you realize that this was your calling? Such a good story. So <laughs> first of all, I never even thought about me having children 
at all. Um, I was, you know, I was a dancer. I was in a professional ballet company. I moved to New York and I studied dance at Alvin Ailey and Martha Graham and Eric Hawkins. I was wow. studying at Strasburg. You know, I was doing that. And I am a theater baby. I love the boards. I'm musical theater. I still love <laughs> yeah. it so much. But um, when I moved out here to California, I was just like, I really am a theater person. I'm not really, I did some TV and some film. I was like, I'm a theater person. So um, I just started doing lots of choreography for like the LA Women's Shakespeare Company and this theater. And then I got pregnant. And interestingly enough, enough, I got pregnant. I found out I was pregnant during the Rodney King riots here in Los Angeles. Oh. Um, and it was kind of like my first, I was the first one of my tribe, all my sister friends, uh, to get pregnant. Um, and then I decided to have the child and everyone said, and this was literally, it was 1992. <laughs> I don't know. Don't get me lying. Um, 91, <laughs> do something like that. Um, and yeah. the conversation that my girlfriends had was like, oh my gosh, you're pregnant. Are you going to have the baby? oh my gosh, what if it's a male child? You know, because, you know, Rodney King had to, was to have, it was like their whole thing. Still the same conversation today, by the way. What if you're having a boy? Mm -hmm. So heartbreaking. But um, I decided to keep him. And then um, I kept on dancing and, and acting and doing all, all the things I was doing while I was pregnant. I had a midwife and her best friend was in town and my son came, um, I think he came a little early. So she said, well, I can come and support you if you like. And I was like, Oh, okay. You know, I was young. I was like, oh, sure. Yeah. And, <laughs> and literally an hour. And I tell the story all, all the time because it's crazy to me, but it's the truth. An hour and a half into my labor, I turned, I looked at her and I said, what is this that you're doing? Because you are saving my life. What is this? What is it called? And she started laughing and she said, I'm a doula. And I said, oh, a doula. Okay, what is that? And how did you do that? And, and she said, honey, we can talk about this after you have your baby. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, I got my journal out. I said, no, no, no. I want to know. I want to know. <laughs> In between my searches, I'm asking her Contract. questions and I'm writing it down every single thing that she did because she was so well-rounded. She had a certification in nutrition, in Reiki, um, in Hello Work Massage, in, all, in life coaching, all these things. And so when my son weaned at three years old, I literally start doing every single thing that she did. I, I trained in all these different modalities. So I would be a well-rounded doula and literally I never looked back. So my friends who are all still in the business all look at me like, I, I, you're the last person I thought, mm. you know, would be catching babies. You're the last person I thought would be supporting mama <laughs> as a doula. You're what happened? I was like, I don't know. And it's not like I don't still do those things. I do a lot. I, I do lots of um, singing background vocals for my friends. I do dance videos. Um, I'm acting in things. I do lots of voiceovers. I'm still doing those things. I'm just not auditioning for them. I'm not, I don't have an agent anymore. But it's interesting. I thought to myself, why would spirit have me go that journey, that route mm -hmm. through dance and acting and what is what is that about and for me to end up here but literally all of it plays out right here right now for me my knowing of the body as a dancer and understanding the the physiology of it really helps me support mamas in labor my ability to be in the present moment on stage and interacting with the energy between the audience and myself and connecting straight to that heart chakra um, helps me when I'm engaging with my clients. And it's actually where I started finding out that I was a person who believed in leading a heart-led life. So everything that I do, say, be, comes through that heart lens first. And it and my ability to to form words and speak, all of that is very much needed now. So it makes sense, but it's really mind blowing to my friends. They're like, 
you <laughs> you are like you went from doing tourgettes and pirouettes to <laughs> doing this and i said yeah you know in a, in a given day my hands are in a woman's vagina <laughs> or they're right there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was my journey, and the, and I just have not, never looked back. Mm. I love dancing; yeah. I dance every day for myself. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's such a yeah. sense of self-expression yeah. to be able to do the arts. Yeah, it grounds me. And believe it or not, dancing, and I think it was because when I I put this connection together when I fell in love with Rumi and I learned about Sufism, dancing connects me to spirit. Just it just instantly has me feel that divine grace and um and then i drop into my divinity and my goddess self and then i walk into the world <laughs> how important to know what takes you there too how important for each of us to know like how to drop into that you know yeah yeah That's so lovely for those of our <laughs> listeners who are like wait 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 i was right where hayes was and i don't know what a doula is will you just give us a quick a, a quick little thing so that they're not left wondering and sure. googling um, <laughs> and googling <laughs> yeah um so a doula is um i was gonna say a woman but actually there are some men now who are doing it and two that i know of right now in los angeles that i actually help um support and train um, but a doula is somebody who is there for emotional, mental, spiritual support. The physical usually is, is taken care of by the midwife and, or the OBGYN. But we know that pregnancy and birth is a holistic field. And I really feel strongly that a doula is somebody who can, is important and, and essential to helping you navigate that field. Because all of it plays out in labor, you know. So I bring um, experience. I bring references. Um, I bring information. Um, and this was actually one of the reasons why I went to midwifery school because I wanted that medical piece, that medical knowledge, and I wanted that information because I realized that a lot of my clients didn't have that information and didn't understand fully exactly what these stages of labors were and exactly what these medications did and exactly what uh, intervention was if, as opposed to a complication. And I really wanted that knowledge and I wanted my clients to have that knowledge. So we are always educating as doulas. We are always supporting. We are now being even more than normal advocates, you know, for our clients, especially if they are, um, in a hospital birth, usually for a home birth, we don't have to advocate, you know, but in a hospital birth, um, a lot of times there is a, a need to let mamas know what they have a choice and a say in, you know, that they have informed consent, you know, that they really need to be educated so they can be empowered and make great choices. Their choices are their choices. They have the right to any choice that they want to make. But my thing is I want you to be educated to make a power choice. So that's one of the reasons why I went to school. But yeah, a doula is either a sister friend, a mother figure, a spiritual counselor, a um, physiotherapist, you know, what all these different categories, or, you know, she's a walking encyclopedia of information and knowledge. Or all of the mentioned. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or all of the uh, aforementioned. <laughs> Do you find that hospitals have been more welcoming to doulas in the past, you know, few years since you've started, or is that still shifting? I know right now, currently, we're in the month where it's early August and doulas are not currently allowed in the hospitals under COVID rules and regulations, mm -hmm. which on one hand, you un I can understand. On the other hand, it's very difficult. Like it's right now, I, that makes me terrified because I know how, for me personally, I know it's not part of everybody's plan or journey and experience, mm -hmm. but how important it is for me. Yeah. Um, I mean, right now, um, there are, you know, there's lots of petitions going around to fight for doulas to be coming in because, you know, doulas are essential. You know, um, so th that is a movement that's happening right now, especially here in Los Angeles um, and, and certain other parts of, of America. Um, in the years 
prior to COVID, I have noticed that, um, you know, when I first said, gosh, those were not welcome. Not welcome, not wanted, and you're just this crunchy granola, airy fairy, hippy dippy chick. You know, they did not want to see us, hear from us, or anything. I have a really good relationship with the hospitals and the staff of the people that I'm when I'm working there because I've been doing it for so long and they know me, but they also know that I'm educated about what I'm speaking of and, and speaking about. And they know that my clients are coming in very well educated. So we usually have these very straightforward bursts. And especially when I come into some hospitals, they're like, oh, it's Hayes, it's Hayes and her people. So we know we're not doing anything. We know we're just, okay. You know, and it's kind of that conversation. Um, so that we're making headway. We still don't have enough. And I know that there, um, there are lots of schools and training s- systems set in place, especially here in California. There are a lot, but there, you know, millions of babies are being born. And if you think about it, you know, and those women want support, they have the right to have that support, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm always encouraging people, oh yeah, you should go through the certification. You should, yeah, you should be a midwife. You know, I'm just trying to get more people in (laughs) to it because really, you know, um, when you think about it, if you're doing a home birth or birthing center birth, that only makes up 1% of all births that are being done. And if you think about the, the numbers and the stats that, that happen when you have a doula in the hospital birth and when, versus when you do not, it's staggering, the difference, you know, um, that you, if you have a doula, it's 45 to 50% certain that you can actually achieve a uninvasive vaginal birth. If you don't, it goes down to like, it's, it's crazy, the, 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 the disparities um, on the impact of, even if it's a woman you don't know, but who's there as support, not there doing a job, the difference is staggering. But there's always been women in birth, you know? I always had like an auntie or a mother or the woman who did the birth. There was always, since the beginning of time, women in the birthing place, in the room, you know, supporting the mama. Mm. A lot of people who never considered a home birth before are (laughs) changing their minds because of the circumstances that we're in. Yeah. Do you find yourself guiding your clients towards one way or another? Um, No, I don't. I mean, I love home birth. I believe in it. I'm a home birther. But I, everyone has the right to birth where they want to. And I'm not going to sit here and judge anybody about it. If they ask me my opinion, I'll tell them. But usually after I've heard what they believe and what they feel, and I'm not trying to um, change people's minds. But, you know, home birth is not for everyone. So the people who are jumping over or have jumped over, I really have to get them to understand the difference. Because a home birth is mother-led, not doctor-led. A home birth, the mom and that partner are the primary caregivers, and we are there just to support and just to be there, just in case something happens, you know? So, you know, and it's, it's a different thing. Midwives hold the space for the mother to find herself and find her power to listen to her body and to listen to the baby and do, that's the ultimate partnership right here. And we're just kind of on the sidelines, just kind of like, you got this mama, you're doing so great, <laughs> you know? Um, until she needs us. And then we, mm-hmm. we come in, but it's always from a level that's right here. Like we're never standing up over her in the sense that we're the all supreme knowing. We don't do that. It's always coming in this way and easing into her energy field and just saying, how you doing, mama? Mm-hmm. How's this feel? You want to try a different mm-hmm. position? Let's, let's go do something else. You know, it's like that instead of versing, you know, like versus just... The busy, the busy, the busy. Right. Yeah. Birth is very, a home birth is very still. And there's not a lot being done to you. Checking the baby, of course. But it's just, it's a different type of energy. And so explaining that to people who've only had hospital births is really interesting. And then when we're in labor, and the baby's born, like I had one, one couple that I did 
with um, we did their birth with Bliss Young um, from Birthing Bliss, and they kept saying when the baby was born, they kept saying they didn't mess with us, and they kept saying we don't have to go anywhere, and they kept saying, <laughs> yeah. oh my gosh, we didn't even draw blood, we didn't have an IV, we didn't, you know, they're just so mind blown that there's a baby and that they did it, and we were just kind of sitting there, you know. It looks like we're not doing much, you know, every now and then we're listening to the baby, but we've got all the equipment set up. We've got everything that we need just in case. And then, you know, when the baby comes out, if the mom and dad aren't catching the baby, then, you know, like this case, Bliss had her hands right there just in case, you know, and we're still just watching and Bliss is coaching just gently, you know, like, like, that's it. Just hold your breath right now. Don't push, don't push. Okay, little push. Yeah, just mm-hmm. like that, just like that. And just breathe and let your tissues stretch, mama. You know, it's just a gentle, beautiful mm-hmm. thing. And then she, Bliss will say, okay, daddy, catch your baby. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And then we got a baby. And then they were <laughs> laughing hysterically. They, I mean, we're talking like 10 minutes of them just laughing. Like, oh my gosh. And their birth, their birth experience in the hospital was beautiful. And they, they have no regrets about it. This was just different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for my first pregnancy, I became obsessed with watching. Uh, I wanted a natural birth for my first pregnancy. And I made it. it it's a longer story. Um, but I essentially had to be transferred to a hospital because there was meconium in the water. And, um, and then it progressed really quickly when I got to the hospital, once I'd had, uh, um, um, epidural epidural. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So within 30 minutes of the epidural, I was pushing her out because it all happened very quickly. (laughs) Um, but I became obsessed with watching natural birth videos because I felt like, okay, if I can see all these other women doing it Mm -hmm. and I know that like, it's not this mountain that can't be climbed. It's it's achievable. Mm-hmm. And if you would have looked at my YouTube page, you would have thought I was into like some really freaky stuff because it was just like all live births. <laughs> but the whole other next level of that, which I found so powerful, were women who wanted to do unassisted natural births at home yeah. and who would literally like set up a camera in a room or their kitchen and then just like squat and catch their own baby. And I was like, wow, <laughs> that is a whole other level of like, you know, dropping into your body <laughs> and like the feminine divine. Have you ever been to a birth where a mother was just like, I got this. I need to be alone to yeah. to catch my own baby. I have. I have. And I was actually at a birth with a um, physician and she kicked us both out the room. So we're in the kitchen. <laughs> and and, oh and we're God. just like, I was like, I have never been in this situation. He was like, I have not. Either. <laughs> and we could hear her. We were like, and he was, <laughs> he, he said, what should we be doing? I was like, I I said, go listen, go listen, <laughs> go pick at the door. And, and but she she literally just was like, oh wait, you guys are my just in case. I got this. And I was mm-hmm. like, oh, because I was her doula at this at this birth. So I was not um being in the midwifery mode. Um, but I was her doula and I said, You're gonna do this by yourself? Well, she said, Yeah, I wanna I just wanna do this by myself. I said, Okay. Um all right, you know, for me, it was like jumping into, oh, this is an unassisted birth now. Mm-hmm. And what am I going to do? And so I thought, okay. And then I, I remember looking at, because um, I also at the time was a midwifery student. So the legalities are are kind of interesting. So I just had to make sure that they wrote out that I was there as a doula, not a medical student, not a midwife, not, nothing like that. And so I decided, okay, she's doing this by herself. Her doctor's right here. I will prepare for postpartum, you know? <laughs> 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 yeah. And so I started baking food and, and soups and making teas and doing all these things and making sure her pasticles were ready. And then uh, she opened the door as the baby was crowning. And of course I ran in to watch, you know, but she didn't want us to say anything. She didn't want hands on her, but she let us witness the birth of the baby. And she literally, it was like looking at Xena. 
She was, but she was a very tall woman and she had her hand down like that. And she just literally just was like, you it was the most ready. beautiful yeah. thing. Wow. I was like, she, I said, obviously she's breathing. I can't, couldn't hear a thing. Like it was just all nasal. It That's was incredible. majestic. Wow. It was majestic. Yeah. So yeah, that is, that is something that a lot of women are doing. And there's some great podcasts that I actually even find interesting listening to. For me, somebody who does not, you know, do unassisted births, um, because of these women's commitment and their education, you have to be really educated if you're going to do a free birth, you know. What are the it's podcasts? Called, um, I think it's called Free Birth. <laughs> there you go. Wow. Yeah. yeah, she's amazing. This woman who leads it, she's incredible. Wow. She's a powerful wow. midwife. <laughs> I love it. I, I definitely was, I, I c- can't, well, this time I've been more hesitant for all the reasons I described earlier, but first time around, I read every book, every, and not like, but just like birth stories. Like I just became so enamored by these beautiful birth stories and how they're all so different, but they're also linked at the same time. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and just like the, power that we have within ourselves as women to be able to do this, like to really appreciate it. Yeah. To really, truly appreciate it. You can take a little it. piece of that for yourself, even if you're not doing an unassisted birth, even if it ends up yeah. that you're having um, a cesarean, you can still take a piece of that empowerment and make it sacred and beautiful and as present as you can. Like I did um, a set of yeah. twins, uh, I guess it was April. It's time, man. Time is crazy right now, collapsing. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, I, I was the midwife for their first baby. And then they found out they were having twins and they decided to do it in the hospital. And baby, one of the babies was breech. And so they decided just to do a cesarean. But we had it so beautiful. We had music in there. We sang happy birthday. It was just the most amazing. And and the physician was allowing the baby to come out slow, the babies to come out slowly. So it wasn't a pulling ink and a tie. It was beautiful. And, and, and mama was just singing and doing the whole thing. It was just the one of the most beautiful, powerful births ever. Um, so there's a, a way to, be fed by watching those videos, by reading those mm-hmm. those birth stories, by listening to those podcasts that you can take a little bit for your own ownership so that that can su- you know, supply you with all that you need in your own journey. Um, for all the, any women who are listening right now who are pregnant, I'm actually one of four of uh, our friends who are pregnant <laughs> right now. Not me. Not and, me. Oh, oh, let me specify. I know, not you. But <laughs> yes, kind of there are, are you guys all doing? There are four. I know. I know. Um, and so, and we're all, all like within a month time? or two months apart. Oh, okay. All around the same time. But so, uh, really, it's, it's um, just a few months, right? Like maybe even a month and a half to two. Where yeah, I have a, one friend who's a who's a month ahead of me and then uh, two friends who are a month and two months behind. Oh my gosh. Are you guys um, all in the same vicinity? One lives across the country. Okay. Um, one, yeah. So three uh, live, live within some, five miles. Calls. Oh my gosh. You've got like friends, yeah. a little friends already. It's a, oh my gosh. <laughs> that's so cute. I love it. Oh my so gosh. So it's nice to, you know, now that we're all, especially entering farther past the first trimester, there's more comfortability and sharing and the excitement and the bond and the community. Yeah. Um, but do you have um, something of comfort for anyone who's listening right now who is pregnant or worried about the hospital or worried about a home birth or worried about feeling isolated during this time mm-hmm. um, and just something that can you know, encourage them to, or I'll say for myself, something to feel encouragement, to feel connected to this pregnancy at a time when I know pregnancy is so out of your control anyway. (laughs) Um, There's a huge element element of that. Um, But when the world really feels out of your control as well, as if it ever was, but. (laughs) You know, I, I believe in affirmations and I believe in, um, 
taking the time to bond with the baby, like just sitting down, hands on your belly, having a conversation with the baby, letting the baby know that the world might look crazy, but you and I can do this. And I believe in you and I believe in myself. And just really kind of talking it down through your womb, through the belly and having that conversation and letting them know the same way you would do if you got into an argument with somebody, you, you would talk to your baby right afterwards and say, okay, I know that was a lot. I'm really sorry about that. Mommy's okay. You have nothing to do with that. You're loved. You're safe. I love you. You're protected. Um, and I will process whatever that was, you know, I, and I still do the same thing now, even though I don't have a baby in the belly, but my body reacts to certain things. And so like, if I have, have almost been hit by a car, you know, my body tenses up, I speak to my body and I say, you're safe. You're okay. You didn't get injured. That was really close, but let go of that stress. Everything's fine now. You know, I'm just always talking to the little girl in me and I'm always talking to my body as an energetic being. And I think that when pregnant women do that and they just kind of envision what their labors are going to look like in conjunction to speaking with their babies, that's very powerful and it kind of sets the tone. And the more intentionality you have in what your labor is looking like, the better you're going to do. You know, the, like you can think about how you're going to feel. Are you going to be smiling? Because it is a possibility to smile during your labor. You can laugh during your labor. Yeah. You're working hard and there's a lot of pressure, but nothing's broken. Nothing is cut. It is um, a way of looking at it and saying, I'm going to be like a child and very, very curious in my labor. And you can say that to the baby. I'm, go I'm so excited to explore who you are and to watch who you're going to be. Those types of actions really help you feel safer and connected and drop you into your belly and also give you food for the labor ahead. You know, it just feeds that, that idea of what that space is going to look like. From what you're wearing to what you are going to be seeing, but the energy you're going to hold in that labor process. Mm. Yeah. I love that. Mm -hmm. And Hayes, you are also an intuitive. Is there anything you can share with us about any feelings you're getting towards where the world is going and what the world will be like in November when Candace is bringing <laughs> a life into the world? <laughs> I think that we are definitely go going to be in that season, in that season of fall, is the season that goes inward. It's the time that is um, where the dark is longer, right? Mm -hmm. The days are shorter. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be reflected again uh, around the world. Um, and I, I feel intuitively that all of this is alignment. And I've, I've said this before, we've been so out of alignment that this craziness is a, a, coming into alignment, everything that we're seeing, all the things that are breaking down, the structures, the constructs, the paradigms, all of that falling away. And it does look messy. It is messy. Um, but I, I feel that I'm very hopeful. I feel really great about the world and about all the things that are coming on the other side of this, because I believe in, I believe in what the planet does it's got a divine system it works brilliantly we're the problem <laughs> we're the parasites on the planet earth um but when you just look in nature and just honor what it does the seasons the ebb and flow the constant change but they remain the same you know um it's a it brings me solace it brings me hope i i really feel that intuitively that this is what alignment looks like and that we will find it. And that right now, because of the way society's constructs are falling apart, our own constructs that have built us up as these humans and these human suits is also doing the same. And just to be kind with yourself and very gentle and not beat yourself up about what you're feeling or the things that you used to believe that are now changing, mm -hmm. but step into the future in a beautiful, whole, 
positive, loving way. Does that answer that? I don't know if I that. <laughs> that answers that and so much more. <laughs> <laughs> Hayes, thank you so much for joining us today. Where can our listeners find you on social media or if they're interested in working with you if they live here in the Los Angeles area? Um, you know, I I think my my strong my biggest platform is Instagram. I don't have a website yet. I might get one, I don't know, but they can reach <laughs> out to me on Instagram or Facebook. On Instagram, it's I am Hayes Hawk Rosen and on Facebook it's Hayes Hawk. And um, yeah, those are the best places to reach me. I do check all my DMs. It's a lot. So it might be a moment before I get there, but I'll get there. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for enlightening us and keeping us grounded in this crazy time and being such a light in a time that can seem dark sometimes. And we're just so grateful to have you. Thank you. This was fun. I really appreciate you having me. Yay. It was so fun. (laughs) So Candice, when we started this conversation with Hayes, you mentioned surrender, right? Surrender was your word and that was your mantra for your last pregnancy and how you are also using it this time around, but it does feel different. Hayes' advice to you was making sure that you surrender to your higher self, right? To go surrender up instead of surrender down is after having this truly enlightening conversation with her, is there something, is there another word you're going to add into your mantra or something else that speaks to you? I think I'm going to have to find it. I really like mm-hmm. some of, um, you know, some of the more common mantras that she shares with mothers that she's working with for clients of, you know, I am powerful, let go, let go. Um, You know, I think it's going to be finding out what it is for this pregnancy and and also honoring that every pregnancy is different and remembering that my experience from my first pregnancy, this does not translate into this pregnancy and and birth and delivery and postpartum um, and being prepared for that. So I know that I think she she exactly hit the nail on the head in saying that we have to surrender up because I use the word surrender as like a like groveling down. Mm-hmm. And um that definitely reframed the word in my head. Uh it just flipped it completely, which right. it needed to be. It needed to be. <laughs> it's interesting. Like you could possibly even keep the same word or mantra, but just have it mean something completely different because you're right. This pregnancy is different than the last. And yeah, one thing as your friend that I'm also finding through this process for you is that, you know, you're right. Pregnancy, you you don't have control and you are such the planner. And when we go on trips with our friends, you like to have the plan and you like to know what you're doing. And this is something that you, you know, you can ha- plan as many things as you want, but it ultimately it's not up to you. The baby inside you is going to decide. And so that's something to always remember, too, is to just like let go and let let he or she take the reins. And um, it's just so interesting to um, watch you go through this beautiful time. And um, I just I know I'm not alone and I know Mel's here too. And all of our listeners, we love you so much. And remember what Hayes said, that you are not the only one who's delivering. There will be millions of other mothers delivering at the same time as you. You're not alone. And um, there's just so much love, even from afar, even through this Zoom call and this pod, <laughs> the podcast, there's so much love that surrounds you. And well, um, you. you're not alone in this. Thank you. Thank you. That really means a lot. And it's hard to remember. Um, and And that's where I've had to really kind of dig through, you know, what are hormones and then what is circumstance and then what is real? You know, those right. are three different areas. Um, how, what about you? I mean, I know right now I, unless you know something that I don't know, but I know about (laughs) 
baby number two in, oh, the, or no. in the future plans. <laughs> yeah, let's, but, let's specify that like those three friends she mentioned, I'm not one of them. <laughs> we are not pregnant. We are, we love having a baby, having our first child <laughs> during quarantine. We've realized that she's spent almost half of her life in <sighs> quarantine. It's been very saturated and we have learned a lot about ourselves, our marriage, about us as parents. I took a lot of what Hayes um, said and I'm trying to implement it into my parenting techniques because, um, you know, it's just a lot of being a mom right now. I went from, you know, not having a child at all to being someone who is quarantined in the house with their child 24 seven Tanner, thank God is working, which we're so lucky in that aspect. But then that just leaves Poppy and I together. And it's a lot of saturated time. And like we've been saying (laughs) during all of this, that it doesn't matter how much you love someone and how much you are so grateful to have them that that much time with a certain human is a lot. And so she's <laughs> um, testing me and I'm sure I'm testing her. I keep telling myself, I don't think she is that excited to be with me right now either. Like, it's OK. <laughs> she probably needs some space, too. But it's just been a whole journey for me as well and learning so much about who I am um, and the kind of person I want to be for her. And yeah. so re- reframing and restructuring um, my mind, my mindset and what kind of example I want to be for her. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts on, on doulas now? I know that when you were pregnant, that was not something that you were necessarily seeking out or desired. You even right. had an episode dedicated to, you know, the difference between a doula and a midwife and discussing all of those topics. Um, now that it's been time, like, is there is do you feel like that you have a better understanding of what they are or do you feel like what what is that experience like for you talking to doulas right absolutely my first um pregnancy i definitely thought oh i don't need that i i feel good i didn't have a doula i didn't have a midwife i really did not have any sort of support system outside of my family friends and my husband and i liked it that way i loved my doctor i saw her for appointments and then when she gave birth and that was enough for me and quite honestly i that experience was so lovely the first time around i think i would do the exact same thing again i yeah. love hayes and i think she provides so much um so much i mean i'm truly feel more grounded just after having that conversation with her But it just goes to show that every person is different. Every pregnancy is different. And that what you need or want is just simply that. And I, yeah, yeah, that's my honest truth. Even after discussing that with Hayes, who is such so extraordinary, I respect her so much. Um, But I think I would just do the experience I had last time because it was simple in every way I wanted it to be. And simple was sort of something I wanted. so yeah, that's how I feel about the whole thing. But man, is she powerful and motivational and just, I mean, I've already follow her on Instagram and I feel like she could be my morning meditation every day. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the wonderful thing about um, like tuning into yourself, dropping into your body and recognizing what you need. And mm. and you were able to do that so wonderfully. And, and also, you know, that even though we can't choose exactly what our birth is going to look like, you know, the, the running joke of like, oh, you have a birth plan. Okay. Good, good luck with that. (laughs) But also you kind of need a birth plan. So just hold on to it loosely. Um, but you know, you can, you can, there are choices in the matter of, um, just what you desire and what in, 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 including, in clicking into, um, what you might need and allowing that to be okay. And so that is, it's the perfect example of, you know, for any listener that feels like you have to have it be a certain way, or you feel like there's no flexibility in that, or you should, you feel like shame because you've decided, well, actually, I just want to have a hospital birth or feel shame because you're like, actually, I want a home birth now and I want to change everything there's no shame in any of that. Like, do you just really have to follow with what you need and, and lean into that? And, and, and so, and you can't plan and control the rest of it, but, but that will service you in the long run so wonderfully. And, and that's what I'm trying to get to is at this point, 
you know, will, will it look exactly the way that I want it to? Probably not. But what can I do to fulfill the needs that I need that are, you know, reasonable within the guidelines of what we have right now? And I feel right. like that's maybe the beginning of my mantra for 2020 at this <laughs> point. <laughs> That'll be my it. birthing mantra. <laughs> Well, we hope you guys enjoyed this episode of Directionally Challenged as much as we did. Uh, We have another great one coming up for you next week. Take care until then. Bye.